The following presentation is brought to you by the Realm Network. Attitude Era is widely considered by many as the greatest product the WWE has ever had. Now, relive the entire journey with exclusive commentary, insights, and episodic discussion with head writer Vince Russo. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this edition, very special edition of Raw, what it was good for. Today, we're going to be looking at King of the Ring 1998, and we have a very special guest. And because our guest is worming around like a stuffed pig, he just made noise and gave himself a way of who it is. So let me now formally introduce him. Fast Eddie Ferrara in the house, ladies and gentlemen. Big round of applause. Big round of applause for Fast Eddie. Sorry for squirming. Sorry for squirming. Didn't realize. I'm just. I'm, I wasn't. I wasn't used to using these headphones. So. And of course, fast Eddie, we have Lazy Lane. This is the first time you and Mr. Lane have met. Introduce yourselves to each other, please. Mr. Lane, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure, Ed. Very nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you. Although I don't know if you if you should be taking that with him calling you lazy, because I I know you're doing all the work. I, <laughs> I know. I've, I've, I've kind of been in your shoes before, kid. Me and you, we got to hook up. i got to give you some pointers. All right, let's, not get, let's not get panicky. Before we get into <laughs> King of the Ring 1990, I have two bones that I have to pick with you. Two of them. Oh, here we go. And, here and we let, go. Me, let me tell oh. everybody, we did, Ed, Ed, did we go over any notes or anything before the show, or am I completely blindsiding We you? went over nothing. You started complaining about my connection. I had to go scramble and hook up on my phone. So, no, we didn't talk okay. about nothing. There are two things, two huge bones I want to pick with you. One. Okay, here's number one. One. Bro, I was very, 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 very surprised to read some Fast Eddie Ferrara tweets, and there was some Sh Shane O'Mac heat. Now, oh. now, bro, if my memory serves, us, serves me correctly, I thought we were highly entertained by Shane McMahon, you know, Vince Jr. I thought we were highly entertained, uh, you know, by the type of individual this guy was. I thought we got a kick out of it. I thought we enjoyed it. I really thought it was no blood, no foul, but it seemed like there's a little heat there that you feel towards Mr. Shane O'Mac. Uh, let's, let's, let's separate the character from the reality. All right. Okay. As far as the character, I thought he was a phenomenal character, and he was very entertaining, and he was also he was he was he was excellent on camera. He always delivered a hundred percent. That's not what I was talking about. I just personally, I just never cared for Shane. Shane to me always was the boss's kid, and he he ran with that in terms of the way he behaved. I, I always felt he was very arrogant, and he was very uh, he was very rude and obnoxious and very entitled. Uh, that's the way I felt about him. Oh, wait, so that's it. So it's not so much heat. It's just eh, I, I, I just never forget, cared for. I think for you're it. forgetting a couple of things. Moments that I think we enjoyed together. What about the, the moment? The oh, yeah. What about bro? Like like father, the, uh, he never wore a coat because you weren't allowed to catch cold. That wasn't highly entertaining. Oh, it was it was very entertaining. I, I never not to take anything away from how entertaining the guy is, and and yeah, that there, he provided many moments where we laughed at him. So that's well, what that's about what what, 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 what about one of my other favorites? And I know you'll remember this, and you'll pop as soon as I say it. All right. The Denali will smoke anything on the road. What about that, bro? Oh my God! See, that I mean, was come a on, man. That was the thing. That was just that. That was his whole thing. Was he was just he was, he was the shit as far as he was concerned. But you know wasn't I mean? that entertaining though, bro? Bro, you know what you're starting to sound like. You're starting to sound like Terry Taylor, who had heat with with Disco Inferno. That's what it's so, you're starting oh, to sound. Oh, really? Like. No, yes. 
no, no, no. I mean, it, it, it's, that at this. yeah, I just never, I mean, this is the same side of me that towards the end, if you remember, I couldn't get away from Vince McMahon. Oh, I know, that, that I know that. So it, it was an extension of that, but to me, Shane wasn't Vince, and he didn't, he didn't, uh, he hadn't, he didn't deserve to be looked up to like Vince uh, and be and be regarded that way. Um, so, uh, but, I, I, but, but yet you you but yet I'm also reading you favored Stephanie, and and me and you were complete opposite when it comes to that. At, well, at the time, yeah, at the time, because Stephanie was just she was just you know Vince's daughter who traveled with us, stayed in the background, was was a was a nice presence to be there. But she she you know here's the thing, if I heard Shane coming down the hallway if we were in the offices or something like that and I heard Shane coming down the hallway, my reaction would be, oh, God. But if <laughs> Stephanie was coming, I'd be like, oh, hey, Steph, how's it going? So that's the thing. Now, today might be a very different story. I don't know if I would care as much for Stephanie today as I did back in the day because back yeah, in the day, no, she bro. wasn't who she is. Yeah, no, bro, listen, I'm, I'm with you with that. Yeah. But in 2002... When I had her on the speakerphone, I saw a totally different person, and that's what stayed with me. That's the. Oh, difference. I totally believe that. I totally because she's gone so completely corporate. Yes. And and everything about her is corporate. So I I, I totally get that. I, I'm just talking my thing. It wasn't like there's heat. It wasn't like anything ever happened with Shane and me. It's just a matter of I just I just don't care for the guy. And, bro, and do I this really is a guy. I'm a guy. I like everybody. You know what well, I mean? Do I really have to be looking up your nose for this whole interview? I, I mean, uh, well, no, I mean, okay. I like you. I don't know if I like you that I'm much. I'm trying to say. I mean, and listen, I want to say that, and I'm saying this as a compliment. Uh huh. I'm waiting for you to break out into silver and gold at any any moment during this interview, bro. You got to go with the pearl eyes. You always got to go with the pearl eyes, right? <laughs> right, bro. Here's my second biggest pet peeve with you, bro. And this okay. may be a knockdown, drag out, because I blame you for this. Mm -hmm. I blame you for this. Oh, there's heat here. Are you happy and satisfied that after 32 years, we're now going to get a glorified NXT match on WrestleMania? I never thought I would saw the day, bro, where we'd see a minor league match on WrestleMania. We're talking WrestleMania, bro. Now mm -hmm. because of you, Mr. NXT, and I know you're working at full stand. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know you're connected with that, but now because yeah, oh so NXT, me. NXT. Oh, I hope you're happy now. We're seeing an NXT match on WrestleMania. Bro, that's enough for me to not not even buy the pay-per-view, to be honest with you. And you know what? I'll tell you this. I, I mean, <laughs> right now. If it wasn't for WrestleMania, you're talking about. Now, let me just get this straight. You're talking about Sami Zayn and Kevin yes. Owens. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That, that's right. it, bro. Let, okay. let, me, let me back up. That's not even an NXT match. That's an independent match. No. Bullshit. Not at all. Not at all. That that to me, that's one of the that is one of the programs that that has about a year behind it. You've got you've got more time has gone into that program than has gone into 90% of the stuff that they're doing on the main roster. And I'll tell you this. You know what I mean? I, I, I didn't see the show last night. I just heard about it. So that's how I knew what you were talking about. Uh, so I don't know how they got into it. I don't know what they did. I haven't watched the show yet. I watch it on Tuesday nights on Hulu. But the one thing I will say is hearing that that match is going to be on WrestleMania, now I've got something I'm looking forward to at WrestleMania. I, I'm sorry, man. I'm absolutely sorry. But there is nothing on that card with the exception of the Shane Undertaker match, which has got that curiosity factor of what are they going to do, how are they going to do it, and how are they going to get out of this? Because from everything that I had read and heard, Shane was a short-term plug-in, a short-term device for the storyline. But everything that he's saying, from what I heard about what he said last night, again, I haven't seen his promo, and what he said in his first promo, he's painting the picture of this broken, dis dysfunctional company, and if he doesn't win, what does that say? That says that we're stuck with the broken, dysfunctional company, as we don't see Shane anymore, and that's, w that's what we've got. So it seems like that's where they're going with it. That, I find that interesting. The main event, uh, 
sorry. I, I, I mean, I, they, they did not build Roman Reigns. I mean, yeah, they were dealt a number of really crappy hands in terms of building him up and, and working toward that. But for a guy who this should be him ascending to the mountaintop, he's already been there. He's been there. He got knocked down. Now he's coming back. And I'm just not into, I'm just not, not excited about that match. There's really no other matches that I'm excited this match, I'm excited about Ed, because I want... I, I, I've been following these characters for a long time. Hey, uh, Mr. Jeff Lane, is there... Yeah, any... He's been real quiet. This is a monumental day in the Attitude Era because up to this point, all the shows we've done, it was just you, Vince, mm -hmm. okay? This is Ed's first day on the job. This is a big deal. So from this point forward, it's a team, and the game changes. I want to get into that with you guys. I, I'm excited to hear the stories of the first day there, I, I know you've talked about it before, but I really want to get into the details of the show. And I'm going to lay the, grain, the groundwork. Okay. Uh, and listen, and honestly, once I lay this groundwork, I, li, feel free to put me over at any time after the groundwork is laid. Because <laughs> I, I, I'll tell you why, and I know you won't disagree with this. Let, okay. let me set the stage on my end, then I'm going to let Ed set the stage on your end, and then you're going to see the marriage. He, he, here's the stage on my end. When I got, uh, you know, that infamous day when Vince threw the magazine on the table and said, this is what the show needs to be. When that meeting broke, me, Vince, and Jim Cornette were writing the television. When we were getting together writing the television, it was clear that I wanted to go forward in a new direction, and Jim Cornette was still doing that old type of Memphis brand, old school wrestling. So there was a lot of this going on in front of Vince between me and Jim. One day I went to Vince's office because I, I, I felt like we were wasting a lot of time and it wasn't good for the company as a whole. As they say, I didn't think it was best for business. So I went to Vince and I basically said, listen, Vince, I think we're wasting a lot of time with me and, and Jim arguing in those meetings. You know, I want to go one way, he wants to go the other way. And, and I said to him, I said, Vince, quite frankly, I, I think you need to pick a door. And I told him, my, my right arm to my children, I could have cared less if I went back to the magazine. I never lobbied for a television writing job. I, I was never going for a television writing job. I still had my job as the editor of the magazine. With God as my witness, I said to him, Vince, if you want to go with Jim, I don't have an issue with that. You know, I'll, I'll go back to the magazine. I've got a job. My job wasn't in jeopardy. If that's the way you want to go, that's cool. But I think we're wasting so much time in that room arguing. We're never going to get on the same page. So sure enough, I left it with Vince. Vince made his decision. Next thing I know, me and Vince are writing the TV. What that really means is Vince Russo's writing the TV by myself, and then I'm presenting it to Vince. That that that's what was happening for a while. Um, at that point, Vince told me, uh, you know, that there was this writer. Um, that was affiliated with the USA Network. He had written some shows on their network. Bonnie Hammer spoke very highly of him, and I, I, I thought very highly of Bonnie Hammer. To this day, I thought Bonnie was a genius. And Vince said, would I mind having him come to TV so we can kind of take a look at him? And listen, I think Ed will agree to this. And I am going to put myself over because that's this is part of why that era was great and today's era, not so much. Vince is basically telling me, now keep in mind, Jeff, I have no experience writing television. None. Zero. Vince is telling me an experienced television writer is going to come to Raw and, you know, we're going to take a look at him. Now, I know I have no experience writing TV, and Vince knows that. I know Ed's got experience writing TV because Vince gave me a little bit of his resume. Bro, if I'm anybody else, immediately protect my spot, protect my spot, protect my spot. <laughs> this writer's going to come in. I'm going to be done as a writer. Protect my spot. Find, figure out every reason in the world why we shouldn't hire this guy. 
But Jeff, I'm telling you, and I preach this all the time. My mindset was Vince McMahon signs my checks. We need to do what's best for this company. And, and I say this all the time. I had enough confidence in myself and my ability that I didn't have to cock block somebody because I was afraid Ed was going to be better than me. I, I've never taken that approach in my life because of my self-confidence. So basically, um, we go to TV. I meet Ed. And listen, bro, pe people got to understand two things. And they, they don't understand two things. And I'm going to tell you, and uh, Ed, listen. People yeah, I was going to say, which bro? Which bro? Me bro or it, Jeff bro? You Ed. Okay, you me bro. I'm going to tell okay. you right now. People talk a lot about racism. A lot about racism. You can't say anything borderline. You're a racist. You're this. You're that. Let me tell you something, bro. And I'm not afraid to say this. People freaking hate me because I'm from New York. They hate me because of my accent, and they hate me because of what I represent. And I've been hated my entire life, especially in the wrestling business, because of where I'm from. I can't tell you how many times from people from the South I I've been called a Yankee, how many times I've been buried because of my confidence and because I wasn't afraid of anybody. So you want to talk about racism? There's racism towards freaking New Yorkers. But on the other side of that coin, Jeff, there are two things. When Number one, when you're a New Yorker, and number two, when you're an Italian, you're brothers, bro. There is a brotherhood. So off the bat, bro, off the bat, Ferrara is definitely Italian. He's a Jersey kid. I'm a Long Island kid. Off the bat, bro, there is a loyalty factor there, okay? So I I'm sold on those two points. Now, here's number three, bro, again, where this is where I should have ran to Vince McMahon and, 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 and buried the short, the balding guy. This is where I should have buried him right here. Jeff, literally, the first conversation I had with Ed, and I say this all the time to this day, 25 years freaking later. The first conversation I had with him, bro, I knew he was he was heads and tails more intelligent than I was. <laughs> I knew I was like the stupidest jabron from Long Island, and, and like, and I didn't care, bro. I don't care that I'm not book smart. I'm I'm an imbecile, and I'm the first one to say it. So the fact that he was Italian, the fact that he was you know a, an East Coast boy from Jersey, and then realizing like how smart he was. Like that right away, those three things, okay. And then what really sealed it for me, and then I'm going to turn it over to Ed. What really sealed it for me, bro, is creatively, he came up with a great freaking spot that day. I remember a little of it. Hopefully he remembers a little bit more. But I want he, to ask you, yeah. Yeah, he came up with a spot that day that I'm like, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. So the combination, bro, of Italian... East Coast, smart and creative, to me, this guy's going to help the product. That's all that mattered to me. I immediately, after we were over and Zvin said, what do you think? I said, hire him. There was no, well, he's good. He needs work here. He's good here. No, there was hire him. And that was it. Ed was hired and the rest is history. So, Ed, I would love you now. Uh, unless, Jeff, if you do you have any questions for me or do you want to turn it over to Ed? No, let's let's hear Ed's side, uh, and All then right. we can get into that. All right, this is this is really interesting because I watched the show last night, the uh, King of the Ring '98, um, and I realized that I, you know, there's so much I don't remember. It was a blur. But here's from my my side, building up to that point, I was at the point in my career in Los Angeles where I was really getting over being in Los Angeles because, like Vince just said, you know, I'm a neighborhood neighborhood guy from Jersey. And Los Angeles is not for neighborhood guys from Jersey. Um, I was getting very, you know, I just wasn't happy. I wasn't happy with what I was doing. But my career was doing this and going up and up and up and up. Um, but I just wasn't happy with it. I was on the phone, and it was with, I, I think, it, I, I actually think it was another USA Network who worked with Bonnie Hammer. And I think it, went to, it got to Vince through Bonnie Hammer. Um, but I was talking to her. 
And uh, uh, this was when I was working on Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. I was I was I was wrapping up my 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 uh, season there, and jokingly because she knew I was uh, an indie wrestler because this was back in the day when I had long bleach blonde hair down in the middle of my back, and I was doing the beautiful Bruce gimmick on the indies. Um, and she knew that about me, and that was always something that that was a fun thing to talk about. I said to her. Just in passing, hey, if you're ever on the phone with, if you ever, if you ever talking to Vince, you know, bring up, bring, mention my name to him, you know, Vince McMahon, mention my name to him, and see if he's looking for any creative help. And I didn't think anything of it. Um, and then, like two weeks later, I got a call from her saying, uh, Vince wants to meet you. And that was where we set up the whole thing of flying me out to that King of the Ring. And that's what was really weird because even though that was my first day backstage at WWF at the time, um, I wasn't really working. I was invited to sit in at the production meeting, um, which we'll get to. Um, and But for the most part, I was a fly on the wall backstage, and I was hung, hanging around the monitor and just watching the show on the monitor from backstage. Um, I, it wasn't until the next night on Raw that I actually, or the next day on Raw, that I actually got to work with Vince. Um, I got to tail you and watch you uh, produce some, some vignettes, and then you gave me a couple of vignettes or, or, or interviews, just backstage stand-ups, to produce. And I remember I did one with Gold Dust. Beyond that, I don't remember, because but I know I did more than one. But I just remember doing one with Gold Dust that next night at Raw. And I think that, that had a lot to do with the hire him thing. Because when we first met, that, like I said, it was a blur for me. Because I was backstage, I was seeing all these all these people that I, you know, spent my life watching, and I was finally, you know, I was rubbing elbows with them for the most part, um, and just taking in the scope of what everything was like backstage. It was it was mind boggling, absolutely mind boggling. Now, the that thing, was that wasn't the hire me moment. The hire me moment. Yeah, the, the hire me moment, bro. And I don't remember it specifically, the, but the it, spot. The definitely, without a shadow yeah. of a doubt, I remember that. And I, I don't remember specifically. Hopefully, you do. But I was like, that's freaking brutal. That was it. I, I don't even remember the gold dust thing. If it was, and that was raw the next night. Now, if it was what I think it is, because as I was watching the show last night, um, I think it was the spot because. I remembered it had something to do with the cage raising and lowering, and I think that going into now, now I could be wrong, but I was just trying to anticipate this, watching this last night, and this seemed to me like it could be what it is because I don't remember specifically either. Um, but I think it might have been in the production meeting the 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 aspect of the cage raising and lowering. Uh, at the top of the uh, the Kane Austin match, for no reason, the cage coming down, um, and we didn't know why. That was already booked, I believe. But I think that my suggestion was, why don't you have Kane hold Austin under in the path of the cage as it's coming down? And because they did that spot in the corner when it was coming down, and that to me seemed like that might have been it. That might have been the idea. I don't nah, know. Nah, bro, it, it was it was some better. It was. It, it then was, it might have been on Raw the next night. That's yeah. the thing, because that was when I was really participating. It might not have been this. Well, and maybe. Also, you, you know what, bro? When when I watch, we're gonna do that next week. When, when I see it, maybe I'll know it. But it was it was it was better than that. Okay. All right. See, I I don't even remember. And I also I remember two things. I remember something about the cage raising and lowering, and I remember something about a gas can. It was so I, it definitely to... something about a gas can. Definitely okay. a gas can is involved. Definitely. I wish I could remember. I wish well, I, I got to watch next week's show. All right, let me know. Was it when Undertaker poured the gas can on the referee? Well, here, here are two things I remember, Jeff. I remember gas can and cane. <laughs> I, I'm thinking it had something to do with cane. That's why I got to watch the next episode because right. maybe yeah. it was Monday. Jeff, let's let's start looking at King of the Ring. But Jeff, like let let's. I, like, let, I don't think we need to talk about like Kai and Ty and and the headbangers. Let's kind of like let's kind of get to like you know the meat and potatoes of, of the show. When I talk about meat and potatoes, we can start with Sable and how freaking giant her boobs are uh, at at this point in time, Jeff. That might be a good starting point. Okay, but I, I did have one question that came from that 
headbangers match. Go ahead, go ahead. The fact when you get to a pay-per-view and there's bonus matches. Like, I don't know if you'll specifically remember this show, but where do they come from? Is it you get there and you're looking at the format and you're like, there's too much time we need to fill? Like, where does... Because normally, you know, if you're going to have so many matches on a pay-per-view, you would build the storylines for all those matches. So where does, like, a bonus match like this come from? Well, I mean, it was... Again, I can't speak specifically for this show because I came in and the show was already written. But it could be one of two things. It could be we show up and after we time things out, yeah, we need a little, we need something to fill time. Or a match is good. <clears throat> excuse me, a match is going to go shorter than we than we originally anticipated. We need to fill some time. Other times it was we wanted to get everybody on the card. We didn't have anything for for this talent, but we still want to get them on the show, get them a payday. Um, so we would book these extra matches because we would always try to have you know like at least seven matches on the pay-per-view card. Sometimes we would have nine, ten. I think we had 11 on some pay-per-views, depending on what they were and what we were doing. But the uh, it, it was one of two. It was either we needed time or we just we, we had the time and we wanted to fill it with talent that we didn't have anything particular on that pay-per-view, but we're going to get them out there anyway. Yeah, and, and Jeff, that's booked going in. That, that that's already booked. That we, we don't book that that day. That that's yeah. already booked going in. We're calling it a bonus match because that's our way of saying, yeah, we haven't built up to this on TV, but we're gonna throw you a bonus. Right. So the Sable segment. I don't know if you noticed this. The, uh, this cracked me up. The security. Four, the, oh, I thought Sable four sixty nine. No, yeah, I saw that one too. I, yeah, I missed that one. But the security guy that's standing by the guardrail, his jaw dropped. When Sable walked by him, I, re- I like it was hilarious. To me. Um, yeah. So she's still doing the Mr. McMahon's assistant deal. We don't know why yet. We just know he reinstated her. They mentioned last episode of Raw. There's a hush order on all that. So she introduces Vince. Vince comes out with Patterson and Briscoe. And this, I love this. I don't know what <laughs> you guys thought, but Briscoe's trying to get Sable. He's escorting her out of the ring, and here comes Pat Patterson, and he taps her on the butt a few times, and she lets him have it, like, stiff slap in the face. He sold it like a million bucks. And JR says, Patterson's getting a little limber in territory he's not familiar with. <laughs> <laughs> so Patterson gets on the mic. He yells to get out of there. Briscoe tells the crowd to have some respect. And Vince informs the fans that if they're there to see Kane set himself on fire, that's a stipulation. If Austin retains the title, Kane sets himself on fire. If they're there for that, then they're setting themselves up for a big disappointment. Hey, uh, uh, Ed, listen, I'm going to turn this over to you because, listen, if I put Patterson and Briscoe over anymore on one of these telecasts, uh, you know, they, 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 they're they going to accuse me of uh, being in unfamiliar territories. Well, just just claim just claim responsibility for them. Just say, just say it was all you, and then, yeah, and then yeah, they'll get was, hot at you anyway. Ed, I, I, this is how I try to explain it with, with Patterson and Briscoe, and maybe you have a different spin on it. I love Ed when I worked with people that had no clue how good they were. Like, I I think Patterson and Briscoe were totally oblivious to how freaking phenomenal they were. Bro, they were the two guys every single show that are popping me, that are entertaining me, that I'm looking forward to every single show. What are your memories about those two guys, bro? Well, I mean, they were a comedy team. They had, and, and, and on numerous levels, they worked so well because just, I mean, they weren't even characters that were really established on WWF TV at that time. I mean, Pat had all the history as the first Intercontinental Champion, and he had been around for a long time, and he was a, he was a color commentator. He was a color commentator right around the time that I first started watching. First it was Bruno, and then when Bruno stepped out, Pat took over, and it was Pat and Vince who were the, the, the announced team for the championship wrestling show. Um, but at that point, you know, they were just, at, for a while, they were just seen on screen when, when we would send out the agents and refs to break out fights, break up fights. But they had such a great chemistry together. You had Jerry was the slow Southern guy who just was very deliberate in everything he said. And he was a, he was, he was a little dim. And Pat was the, the hot-headed one who was the, the talker of the two and the, and the, and the, the more, the more, uh, uh, 
you know, the more outgoing of the two, but together they were such a phenomenal comedy team. Uh, and and but it still worked because they didn't make Vince McMahon any less of a of an imposing force, even though they were his lackeys, his 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 thugs. One thing I did want to say, and one thing I do remember from this day, and if I bring this up, you're probably going to remember this, Vince, once I say it. Um, but this was a this was a uh, a, a, a really hard day for Pat, and I don't remember if this happened before this segment when they went out or after, but this was the day that Louie passed away. Wow, bro. How, Pat, the, how, how did okay. you remember that, bro? Okay, it's one of the few things that stuck with me because here's the thing. I always loved Pat as a performer, and it was an honor to work with him and get to know him the time that I was there in WWF working with you. Getting to work with him was phenomenal. He was my first live main event. First live main event I ever saw, Asbury Park Convention Hall, Pat Patterson versus Larry Zabisco for the, for the IC title. Okay, so here I am backstage, and Pat had been, everybody had been so nice to me and welcoming me in the production meeting and talking to me and going out, of my, going out of their way to make me feel welcome. At one point during the day, and that's why I said I don't remember when. It was either in the afternoon. I was, feel like it was in the afternoon. It was later in the day. Okay, but was it after the show had yes. started? Yes. Okay, so then maybe it was after this segment because I was watching this segment last night and I was going, "Oh my God, if yeah. this is that day, he's yeah. he's phenomenal." Yeah. I remember seeing Pat coming backstage and somebody walking up to him and giving him a hug and Pat breaking down in tears yeah. and just sobbing yeah. with this person. I don't remember who it was, but and it was I was about maybe fifty feet away from him. It was just something I saw in the distance and I had no idea what was going on. I just knew something really terrible yeah. had happened for Pat. And then I found out after the fact, I think I asked you the next day, uh, and you told me, but yeah, he had just gotten the news that his his partner of how many years uh, for, uh, forever, had passed bro, away. Forever, yeah. Um, yeah. And wow, it, wow. See, Ed, I, I did not yeah. know this was the same day. Yeah. yeah, that was that day. Because, again, I, was, I wasn't even like, following you around. That's how I know it was that day because I remember I was standing by the monitor and I looked off to the side and I saw this exchange happen. So yeah, that was the day. Um, so that, so that, you know, wow, what a tough day for Pat. Bro, how can you, I, I'm going off, I'm going off road here because of my ADD. ADD or CBB? Both. Both. You know how? what CBB is, right, Jeff? No. It's something, it's a disease that Vince suffers from. It's called CBB. It stands for can't be bothered. Right, can't be bothered. Can't how be bothered. Can, how can you sit there uh -huh. and talk house. about the very first match I went to see at Asbury Park was Larry Zabisco versus Pat Patterson? What do you mean? How can, how can, how can you sit there and say that and then say you're excited to see Sami Zayn versus Kevin Owens? I, 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 no, whoa, whoa, whoa. Digest that for a second. Larry Zabisco and Pat Patterson was your first main event, mm -hmm. and you're excited about Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens. How? how, how, how? Um, hold on. Let me see. I can respond to that. Give me one second. I'm doing the to Don't tell write the truth. Big words. Give me. Don't write big words because I won't know what they mean. Make it. Keep it simple. You see this? Oh, see, you see, you see, bro. That's the answer to everything, bro. You know what? It's a different time. Reminds me of and Remember when there was something creative, and it and, and like a lot of times it came from Vince, and mm -hmm. it didn't make sense. And you and I would freaking look at each other like, remember, bro? Remember Dustin was going to be the naked guy in the full body stocking, <laughs> and you and I looked at each other and were like, oh, really, Vince? Yeah, bro. Yeah. But remember, like when Vince used to come up with things that didn't make sense, and you and I would look at each other because we were sticklers, bro. If it didn't make sense, what was what was Vince's two favorite words, bro? That's what a different time reminds me of. What did he always used to say, bro? Uh, I'm trying to think. He said there was there were a lot of things he said. Um, 
artistic liberty. Liberty. Did that not <laughs> drive us freaking cry? I hated well, that, bro. Well, it drove us crazy because he would come up with these ideas, and then it would be up to us to come up with a way to make it work right. and make it make sense. Right. You know, he would have the idea, but then we would have to actually figure out how we would execute it because we're the one looking at the whole show as a you know from a bird's eye view. But Vince was just zeroing in on moments in the show and making them better, but then we still had to transition and make it all work as one. So, yeah, a lot of artistic, artistic liberty, and yeah, that drove us crazy to, because oh, that just that. meant, oh, now we got to make this work. How are we going to do this? Uh, he's, that, you, know, you know, Jeff, a lot of times, like you heard it, um, somebody told me this week, uh, you know, and I don't want to say who, somebody in the business, um, that, you know, it, it was, it was, it was said again, bro, this is 25 years after the fact, that Vince Russo is hard to work with. This is part of Vince Russo being hard to work with, Jeff. When, when I would be in a booking meeting and something didn't make sense, I, I, I would say it, that doesn't make sense. If it makes sense, make sense out of it. We're not going to put something on that does not make sense. So, yes, in cases like that, I was very difficult. Ed was very difficult. But you would be shocked how many times people just wanted to book something like that just absolutely made no sense. And we'd sit there and say, no, you can't do that. That doesn't make any sense. You know, yeah. it, go, it goes back to, bro, we, we can look at the way, Ed, that the Taker-Shane match was made. The way the match was made makes no sense whatsoever. No. And, right. and, and Ed would have been, we, Ed and I would have been in that room till freaking midnight until we would have came up with something feasible that made sense. Shane comes in holding all the cards. He's got something over Vince's head. Next but thing you know, he, match. yeah. Next thing you know, he's agreeing to a match that he doesn't have to agree with. You know, Ed and I would have been like, no, like that makes no sense. So that's a lot of times where the difficult to work with. No, no, bro, we wanted the show to be the best that it could be. Would you vouch for that, Ed? I would totally vouch for that. And I think that, yeah, we were, we were, we were difficult to work with if you wanted to just do it the way it had always been done for decades and decades. Right, right. Because we were doing, the, the, the product we were doing was very different. I mean, even just looking at the King of the Ring pay-per-view, I was blown away by the fact that there was nothing in the back. Nothing. And we, I guess we hadn't really started doing that. I mean, we always did less in the back than we did on Raw, obviously. You know, whether it be whether it be vignettes or promos or, or, or scenes. But... Um, I was really surprised that there was absolutely nothing in the back on that show, but that was something that we were that we were that we were changing the way the product looked and changing the voice of the product. And part of that is that attention to detail and making the shit make sense because that was the thing that would always drive me insane as a fan when they would do something. I'd be like, "What? What is your reasoning for this?" And we would go out of our way to try and make sure that everything made logical yeah. sense. And not just for the moment, but also down the line in case we wanted to call back to it, in case we wanted to do something later that, that was, you know, that would tie into it. So it had to make sense because we couldn't remember our faulty reasoning down the line. This is what nobody wants to talk about, and you hit the nail on the head. Casual fans like us sitting at home saying, you know what? That stuff, Jeff, doesn't even get brought up today. There's nobody there saying, wait a minute. That's where we're difficult to work with because we don't make it easy for you. That's where we're difficult to yeah, work with. We're difficult because we try and make it better and we try and make it make sense. How many times, and let me ask you, how many times when we were working at TNA, the last run, when we would be in a booking meeting and I would open my mouth, how many times did you just feel this wave of uh, yep. coming from Eric every yep. time I opened my mouth? Yep. Because what was I doing? I was trying to make it make sense. Yep. And it was he, he didn't care about that as much because it made sense to him. But what I'm trying to bring up is maybe it makes sense to you, but it doesn't make sense. And we've, right. got, to, we've got to bring that to the audience. And I'll say one other thing, and I'm going uh, uh, to put it over the two of us because, again, you, know, you, brought it, you brought it up. You started bringing up the Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens thing. But now just imagine because you and I, we're not the same person. We have different, uh, we have different appreciations. We have different things we like. 
how I I am convinced that if you and I were doing the product now, that we would come up with a way to use those two guys that would satisfy both of us. No, and bro. That would, no, and that no, would no, put bro. Them through the roof. Those two guys would be stars if we were writing the show. They they, yeah. they they would be stars. They we wouldn't be having this combination combination. They would be stars, bro. Bro, those two guys would have been stars the day they walked out in, into an arena. They would have been stars. That's the issue, bro. That's and right now and right now because the creative is so lax and so weak in my opinion, that's why I'm really excited about that match because at least I'm getting a match that I was interested in over a year ago. And at least I'm getting to see that because that is a storyline that they develop all through NXT. So maybe I understand what you're saying that, you know, for the raw main roster product it comes out of nowhere. I understand that. But for me, as an NXT well, fan, no, no, that was it's my whole, something that, to make me happy, yeah. and that's, like I said, that's something I'm excited about. Well, but that was that's my what, whole point, bro. My whole point right. was, if if you don't watch NXT, you don't know who this guy is. It's a different time. Yeah, all right. All right, Jeff, get ahead. Bro, bro you do know Jeff. I'm, I'm just going to tell you right now. <laughs> this is a two-part show, so don't even try like rushing. Ed is very long-winded. I should have told you that up top. Ah, so don't even like try to like. Let's just do the show because this is definitely two parts. So okay. Ahead, bro. Okay. Well, I did have a question for Ed before we we continue on. Like you're going into this day, Vince says, "Okay, come. I, I want to meet you and talk to you." What were like you're obviously you could tell the product had been changing up to this point. What were your thoughts about how WWF was evolving? From the kitty stuff to the adult stuff, as it and like, were you paying attention to WCW? Like, what were your thoughts on the on the current products at the time? That's a that's that's an excellent question, Jeff. Um, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you somebody's got to put you over. We can't just keep putting him over. So, um, I, 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 at the time, I was, uh, uh, you know, I always was a dyed in the wool WWF fan. That was what I grew up on, New York, New Jersey. That was all I got when I was a kid. Um, I also, at the time, was an ECW fan because when WWF was going through their phase of the Mantors and the TL Hoppers and the Goon and the Freddie Joe Floyds and all of that, that, to me, the product was dying. And Friar Ferguson, don't forget Friar Ferguson and Bastion Booger. Um, the, uh, the 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 product to me creatively I, I just I couldn't watch it I was so it was the first time in my life that I was having a hard time watching the product so that was when I discovered ECW and to me ECW I was like this is what I'm looking for this is this is wrestling that doesn't make me feel ashamed to be watching it it's not a guilty pleasure it's just something that 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 appeals to me as a grown up as an adult wrestling fan so. As WWF started to change their philosophy and get edgier, I was all over it because at the time I had been watching Nitro. And also, don't forget, at this point, that was when I also was I was wrestling indies in Southern California. So again, this all really appealed to me. Um, and seeing it going in that direction, I loved that. And that was why I was really excited at the opportunity to, to go out there. I didn't think I was going to get a job out of it. But to me, it was it was just worth it to go out, get a chance to meet them. You know, who knows? Maybe one day it might it might lead to something. Was what was in my mind. I wasn't expecting three days later to get a call from Vince McMahon saying, "How would you like to do this full time, Pally?" So I wasn't expecting that at all. So I I wasn't you know I had nothing to lose. I was just there. I was just there. I was enjoying the moment. I was enjoying being backstage on Sunday. I was enjoying. The, the, the following Vince around on on Monday and getting to do a little bit of production, uh, it was a blast. And I didn't think anything more of it when I left at the end of that trip. Um, and then is history. So uh, uh, I really was a big fan of the, the the way that the product was going, and I was I was really lucky to be able to ha have a part of that. What's going on here? Is there a fight going on in the background? No, my daughter with the ice machine over there. She's totally she's to, she's totally ignoring that there's a podcast going on through the other side of the curtain. But uh, oh. go go ahead, Jeff. Let's let's get on with this uh, okay. fabulous show, shall we? 
Yes, yeah, so both King of the Ring semifinal matches were next, and the first one was Jeff Jarrett versus Ken Shamrock. I got a kick out of Lawler putting over a sign that said Double J ain't he because you're not going to hear anybody put over that sign today. No, no. Oh, yeah. Um, How about all the signs? Too? I'm sure you've hit this ad infinitum on, on your show. How's that big word for you? Oh, ad infinitum? God. No, Latin. I, I threw a Latin. I'm breaking out the Latin. Kid. Get the dictionary. Um, Here we go. So... But yeah, I mean, and Jeff, just I just want you to know. I just want you to know he does that on purpose. Oh, he totally yeah. does that on purpose to make me look like a freaking uh, Mama Luke. Go ahead, go ahead. Ed, sorry, you don't need me. any help from me, kid. Yeah, you don't ahead. need any help from me. But how about you know the opening? Uh, 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 Franny was watching it with me last night, and she was blown away by the opening Crazy. with panning across the house and seeing like everybody in the house with a sign. It was like nothing but a sea of signs. It, it just the product is not is not there anymore. There's, it doesn't engender that kind of passionate support on the on the part of the audience. Yeah, I remember in college getting ready to go to a wrestling event, and my buddies were so excited about making the sign. That was like one of the biggest parts of going to a wrestling <laughs> show. Was, what is our sign going to be? Who's going to make it? Is it going to look good? Are we going to have one sign where three of us are holding the piece. Like I just remember that was just such a huge deal back then, and and you're probably right. Nobody really cares about that anymore. Jeff, the next uh, the next WWE event I go to, you know, my sign's gonna say, <laughs> Rudy sucks. <laughs> Why you gotta pick on Rudy? Why you gotta pick on Rudy? I right, go ahead, Jeff. So Shamrock gets the win over Jeff Jarrett in the first semifinal, and the second one. A uh, little more involved as far as outsiders are concerned. Rock beats Dan Severn because of D'Lo Brown returning, and this is the first time he's wearing that chest protector. And he hits the frog splash while the referee is tied up with Godfather and Mark Henry trying to get them to the back, allows Rock to get the win. So our final set now, Shamrock and The Rock. And Vince, you mentioned last week how you, you saw that it made it look like we were going to get that Shamrock-Severn match. Right. Do you remember wh why the reason was decided here to have The Rock? Well, bro, I, I, I'm going to – yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I, I'll tell you something I had a little bit to do with it. There's a uh, – uh, you know, uh, somebody uh, so, somebody from my past is out there again, and I'm not even going to dignify it by saying his name. And and now the latest rant is uh, Vince Russo screwed Dan Severn. Okay. Let, for, first of all, let, let me let me let me let, let's look at that comment in, in within itself. Vince Russo screwed Dan Severn. Vince Russo, I think it is apparent to everybody, you know, is not a fighter. Uh, is is not a guy that's going to instigate a fight, uh, especially with an MMA fighter. Like if 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 Dan Severn looked at me cross-eyed, I would I, I would I would hop in my car and point it to freaking Mexico. So the thought of me screwing Dan Severn, if somebody would have said, okay, Vince Russo screwed Goldberg, uh, Gilberg, uh, okay, maybe uh, Vince Russo screwed the Brooklyn Brawler, all right, yeah. Vince Russo screwed an MMA killer. Like I don't think like that's going to happen. But, you know, the, the latest rant is Vince Russo screwed Dan Severn. And, like, I don't even I, – I, I can't e – I, I won't listen to that. I can't even imagine the explanation for me screwing Dan Severn. What I would tell you is this, Jeff, and I think Ed can verify for this. you got to understand, when ECW guys were brought in, when, like, MMA guys were brought in, Vince was not familiar with these guys. Like, the ECW guys would come from Pritchard, you know, because Pritchard was tight with Paul Lee. The, the MMA guys would come from JR. JR was into that stuff. So when JR says, hey, Vince, there's this guy Shamrock. You mind if I – Vince don't know. Vince doesn't watch television, bro. He don't know MMA. He didn't know Shamrock. So now, Jeff, all of a sudden you got Shamrock and you got Severn. Well, Jeff, it, it, it was easy to see – the personalities of those guys and how they fit into professional wrestling. Shamrock was tailor-made for it. Shamrock could cut a promo. You could believe Shamrock was mad and pissed off. Shamrock fit in perfectly. Severn was an MMA, uh, you know, collegiate style, Greek and Roman, whatever it is, wrestler 
He could not talk, bro. And when you put the two of them together, it, it even made Severin look worse. So, bro, now when you start getting into when Vince starts seeing Shamrock and Severn and Ed and I start getting a feel for these guys, well, bro, you know they're both MMA fighters, they're both killers, but who's got the money and who are you going to make the money with? Ken Shamrock. So, you know, what it really comes down to is Severn really couldn't cut that wrestling promo. He didn't really have that personality. And without that, you're only going to go so far. Some people have it. Some people don't. Shamrock had it. So Shamrock is the guy you're going to go with. But again, you know, that somehow, some way is translated to Vince Russo kill the career of Dan Severn. No, we had two MMA, two MMA fighters. One was going to get over. One was going to be that gimmick. Who was going to get over was the guy with the better personality. And that, that, that's why things kind of panned out that way. Do you remember any of that at all, Ed? I remember a lot. Uh, I mean, obviously not going into this match at this pay-per-view. But, yeah, I remember that because the thing is, Dan, and, and, and if you remember, I mean, Dan was, he was a gentleman. Right. He was so well-spoken. He was, and, and he was a gentleman, and he was a very gentle person and any time we tried to shoot a promo with him and we needed to get over the beast side of him it just never got over he couldn't he couldn't tap into something to to bring that out in his promos and they always made him look like less than what we needed him to be and it was it no no you know no just Nothing against him as a as a talent, but in terms of what we were doing with the product, and we were booking, you know, the the what we were doing was we were booking the guys who we can get over their characters. We really had a hard time getting his character over because the only way we could do it is in the ring, and we, you know, anybody we put him against, those were people who we were able to do more with their characters. I do remember that we held off for a while putting the two of them together and then ultimately we finally did it on an episode of Raw. And I remember we built up to it all night long. It was going to be the first ever collision between Severn and Shamrock um, because at that point, you know, we were like, well, we might as well do it now because we're only going to be able to get so much out of Severn because we really can't get that character to 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 find uh, find legs, so we we you know we, that's what we were stuck with. Now, if he had the same personality as Shamrock and he had the same charisma as Shamrock, we could have gotten both of them over. But it was just you know for as good a fighter as Severn was and as good a wrestler as Severn was, he just didn't have that it yeah. to get him over with a mic in his hand. Yeah. Get him over when he wasn't in the ring. Yeah. And, 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 Jeff, this is where you'll see a lot of people that have heat with me. Like, because th th there are reasons people did not get over. You know, I mean, bro, our, our job what was, you know, I mean, our, our job was ratings. So if you're over, you're on the show. If you're going to get over, you're going to go on the show. It, it, had, it was nothing personal. You know, just another case in point, totally off track. But, like, okay, the fallen angel, Chris, Christopher Daniels. What the f is the fallen angel? What? Why are you the fallen? You, you, you know, like it, it's it's stuff like that. Yeah, bro, you can go out and you can work, and you're a great worker. What's a, what's the fall? Explain to me the fallen angel. When a talent can't explain to me the character, what are the chances of that talent getting over? But that that's like so so it just explained perfectly the dilemma with Severn, you know, in 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 the eyes of my Lex, you know, Luthor. Vince Russo killed Dan Severn. I, I didn't go out there and cut the promos for Dan Severn. He went out there and cut the promos for Dan Severn. But that's what it always – it always goes – comes back to the writers. And, and well, everything here's, was a fault of the writers. And the thing is – and this is where, this is where you know, okay, where, where maybe it is the fault of the writers. And, I'll, and I'll, let's, let's explore that for a second. Maybe it is the fault of the writers because if 
if the wrestling business hadn't evolved, if we hadn't been on top of that and rode that wave of that evolution and embraced it and kept it going and kept pushing the product in a new direction and focusing on character and story over in-ring quality, if it was still the same wrestling that we were watching in the late 70s and in the 80s and before that, if that was the case, then yeah, we, we, then yeah, we did. We, we did. We did screw Dan Severn because that... That wrestling, the old wrestling, Rasslin, he could have been the world champion. He could have been the world champion, but how many people would have been watching? Instead, we changed the product, and we made it a product that became a mainstream phenomenon, pop culture phenomenon, and guess what? There wasn't a place at the table for somebody who couldn't cut a promo at that point. So if you want to look at it that way, then yeah, I guess we did screw him because it, it, we 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 we... We encourage the company to grow and to evolve to a new level as opposed to keeping it down and where where he could have flourished. Yeah. Well, let's not forget though, Ed, before you jump the jump the gun here, let's not forget, you know, we it's a different time and we may have, you know, changed the business and re uh, 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 revolutionized the business, but let's not forget uh, Vince McMahon edited all our stuff and without the editor uh, there would have never been a Vince Russo and a Ed Ferrar. Let's not forget that, please. Let's not forget that. That's, tr that's true. That's true. That keeps us humble. That keeps us humble. Oh, keeps us humble. Okay, go ahead, yeah. Jeff. <laughs> Next was the Too Much versus Al Snow and head match. Jerry hey, Lawler. Hey, Jeff, I'm stopping you right here. All right. <laughs> I got in an argument with Sean from Wrestling Inc. yesterday. Jeff, you're going to get a kick out of this, okay? Because I, I, I told him, bro, Unless you watch NXT, you don't know how who Sami Zayn is. Okay, he's a very vanilla guy coming out of the crowd. So he, uh, so Sean goes, "What would you have done?" I said, "You you set the table for him." I love using the term "set the table." You do the vignettes. You you make him a big star before he ever sets foot in an arena, right, bro? Bro, Sean uses the example to me. Whoa, whoa, oh. What about Al Snow? Hey, nobody knew Al Snow. Al Snow was in ECW. When Al Snow came on the WWE, he just appeared on the show. There were no vignettes. What about Al Snow? I said, Sean, the guy was walking around talking to a head, bro. He was talking to a head. He had Help Me written on his forehead. He wasn't Sammy Vanilla Zane, bro. I don't think Al Snow needed too much of an introduction when the lunatic is walking around with a head talking to his freaking head. On top, on top of that, you've got all the stuff. Sorry, Jeff. Uh, all the stuff that he was doing, that was... The, those were the vignettes. Yeah, thank that you. was, I was getting his character over because this was his first match. This was his first actual match. I mean, to the point where he came out with no music. Why? Because he's not on the roster. So he's going to come out with no music. Why? Because that makes sense. That's logical. If you got a guy who's not on your roster, why are you going to give him music? Why is he going to have his own theme music or entrance video when he comes out if he doesn't work for you? When you think about Jeff, like, look, at, I hate to pick on the, the Sami Zayn thing. And it's not personal against Sami Zayn. I think Sami Zayn's a great worker. But when you look at the big picture, Jeff, Let's look at the history of Sami Zayn. He comes out. We don't know who he is against John Cena, and, and, and he fights a hell of a match but loses to John Cena. Okay, now, I'm talking about the WWE history. He loses to John Cena. The next time we see him, he, he magically appears in the Royal Rumble and gets eliminated in the Royal Rumble. That's the second time we see him. The third time the WWE Universe sees him, He's attacking Kevin Owens, and we're supposed to be excited about a guy that we saw lose to Cena, and we saw him get eliminated from the Royal Rumble if we don't watch NXT. Do, I mean, do you understand, like, what I'm... And, and they can't understand why, if I'm not a fan of NXT, why, like, am I saying, who the frig is this guy? Let me ask you a question. Can I ask you? Can I Absolutely. ask you a question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, because I didn't see it last night. When he came out and he jumped Owens, did he get a pop? Yeah. Okay. Well, then, if you don't know who he is, that's going to make you go, oh, no. Well, 
I don't know who this guy is, but they know who he is, so bro, let me, let me no, watch. No, 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 it's not going to make you do I that. Into, no, bro, you know what that's like? That's like it's a different time. No, bro, if somebody don't know who he is, they don't care who he is, bro, because the internet wrestling community crowd is popping for him. Mm, let's, move let's move on, Jeffrey. Okay, Ford, let's move on. It's, let's move it's on. starting to get on my nerves a little bit, to be honest with you. <laughs> Are you? Am no, I gonna? Am I gonna? Are you gonna roll your eyes at me like Eric used to do? <laughs> Ed, what's a draw, Ed? What's a draw? It's a yeah. draw. Go it's ahead. A draw. I'll tell yeah. you. I'll tell you who it is. Go ahead. That I was just going to say, like, I totally agree with what Ed said about Al Snow because, Vince, how many shows have we done now oh with Al? Bro, hey, and this dress, is the first time he's stepping in the ring. Dressed like a woman, dressed like a Mexican the one show. I mean, I went on and on and on, bro. Yeah, all the meanwhile, I mean, that was, the, that was his intro. That was the character. That was the story. He doesn't work for them. He's showing up with a ticket. He's trying to talk with Vince McMahon to work there. That's his vignettes and with Lawler getting him over in the process, so. Yep. Totally let, 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 let me take this one real quick. Okay, Let's, take it. Because it's hysterical to me. Because he is, we effed up here big time. And, and this is all me. Ed, Ed's not writing the show. Bro, it was a funny gag that Brian Christopher has the head and shoulders, and he attaches it to the head, and he pins the shoulders. That's funny on paper. The crowd didn't understand it. It was not visual enough, bro. So it was a fart in church, and I totally understand why – I totally look back at this now. I take 100% responsibility. Oh, bro, we're cracking up booking that. He'll pin the shoulders. But visually, how's the person in the nosebleed section supposed to see that head and shoulders, right? So it completely fell flat. But here's, the, he, here's JR's line of the night when we do that. Ladies and gentlemen, that was a first, and I guarantee you that little piece of business will likely be the last. <laughs> <laughs> bro, I love, I love Jr. I love, bro. Listen, there's nothing better, there's nothing worse, Jeff and Ed, than an announcer trying to put over something that's terrible. I love the fact that this is totally terrible, and freaking Jr. buries it. I, I, I love that. That's why Jr. had credibility, bro. Can you imagine Jr. trying to put this over and have credibility? So he, he it was a fart in church. It was executed on our part horribly, and Jr. just buried it, and I loved them for it. Or could you imagine it now, where they would they would put it over, and they right, would act exactly. like it was the greatest thing ever? Oh, <laughs> <God>. <laughs> yeah, Jr. seemed very uncomfortable calling this match by himself. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to, to say the least. But you, you know, the predictable outcome here would be okay. Al has to win, so he's on the roster. That's what everybody's expecting. Well, no, Al doesn't win, so he still doesn't get his meeting with Vince. He's still not on the roster. And I think that's one thing that you both have always talked about is going left when they expect you to go right. Bro, I think they have the, the perfect opportunity. Bro, if it, if it were me, and I think I can speak for Red too, if it were us, bro, freaking Dean Ambrose is going over at that fast lane, fast speed bump, whatever oh, the yeah. it is. Ambrose oh, is yeah. going down. But you know why they don't do that, Jeff? First of all, if they do it, I will stand up on my chair and applaud them. The reason why they won't do it is because creatively, they don't know where to go with that. They don't know where to go with that. Where me and Ed would sit down and say, okay, bro, everybody knows Triple H is beating Ambrose because he's meeting Roman Reigns at WrestleMania. That's how our conversation would start. Then we would look at each other and say, okay, bro, what if Ambrose wins the match? Nobody mm -hmm. sees that coming. What if Ambrose wins the match, Ed? Where do we go from there? See, that that's where they fall short, bro, because they don't have those answers. We would come up with those answers, and then we would go down a totally different road that you never saw coming. Right, Ed? Plus also we, 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 absolutely. Plus, also, we weren't afraid to change stuff up. I mean, first of all, we put a lot of thought into things at the beginning. We didn't just say, what are we doing this week? We'd say, how's that going to affect things next week, the week after, at the pay-per-view, all the way down to WrestleMania. We'd try and see how the ripple effect would affect what they're doing, as opposed to doing something, and then next week going, oh, how are we going to follow that up? I have no idea. Let's just ignore it. Yeah. So we, we, we would have we done that because we would have thought it out in a, ahead of time, and we wouldn't have been afraid to change direction, especially considering how the, the, the Roman Reigns experiment really is not panning out the way that they are 
expecting it to, but yet they're staying the course rather than saying, okay, we have to do something about this. They're trying to do something, but they're but the, what they're doing is just feeding into what the fans have a have a problem with, which is him being the chosen one and them just jamming him down their throats. If if it was us, Ambrose would be going over at Fast Lane, and then Ro- Reigns would be a heel. At Wrestle, if not before WrestleMania, coming out of that match, and maybe yeah, put the belt on him as a heel, because then you could have Shane go over at the end of the night if you wanted to do that. Yeah. Next yeah. was X Pac and uh, Owen Hart. I had a question. Like I don't know if you noticed this, but they did a spot that was on the Spanish announce table, which we all know is going to get destroyed by Foley later in the show. How does that work with the agents? with the talent knowing what match a table is going to be broke do they tell everybody make sure you don't do, go near this table or you know how what cuz i'm thinking what if that broke what would that would have done for the for that hell in the cell if that would have broke so how does that work well i mean it, it would just it would depend case by case basis depending on the show but yeah if there was a spot going on word would go out to to the other agents to tell their talent to stay away from this table now Maybe they might have done that ahead of time and the 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 had the short up so that way they could do this spot. My thought is because I remember there was a lot of back and forth with that main event, and I'm sure we'll get to it. There's a lot of back and forth over are we doing this spot, are we not doing this spot? So it could have been a it could have been a miscommunication. You know, at one point in the day, I, I'm sure that at one point in the day there that they weren't doing the big spot off the top of the cage, so maybe that never got back to them. But, you know, uh, it, it's a case-by-case basis. But usually, yeah, they would try and watch out for that. And X-Pac goes over here, uh, interference from Mark Henry, Vader again to uh, go after Mark Henry. That storyline continued. This allowed – Owen had the sharpshooter on X-Pac. X-Pac's tapping, refs outside the ring, allows China to sneak in, hit the DDT on Owen, breaks the sharpshooter, X-Pac rolls over, covers to the win. Any thoughts on, on this? Ed, can you verify uh, that Vader never washed his tights and he always stunk? <laughs> yes. Okay, um, thank you. There's, yes. there's a verification, well, Jeff, Vin, that you Vince, used, Vince used to call him Big Stinky. Don't you remember that? Uh, and it was like it was a vomit smell, bro. It was, oh, it was just uh, it wasn't it, no no a vat of Febreze could uh, have gotten that out. Uh, uh, yep, Big Stinky. Uh, Paul Bearer in ring promo. Oh next. my god! Mm. So thoughts on that? He he talked about Kane's childhood watching the Undertaker. Daddy, I want to be like him, Daddy. I want to be like him. <laughs> and then he wraps it up with, uh, "Bro, I I wrote this down." You're laughing all the way to the bank. <laughs> then, yeah, then you can laugh at the fat man all you want. And we had the greatest scene. You would have popped for this huge in last week's show. And I saw this and I said, "Listen, I'm just gonna say it." Vince Russo is an absolute genius. I'm, I'm going to say that right now. And you would have popped you. So let me tell you what. Let me tell you what was going on. The week before, Taker had beaten the ever-loving crap out of Paul Bearer. He got him ca- caught inside the cell. He beat him to a bloody pulp. Okay, bro. So the mm-hmm. following week, because he was all beat up and stuff, he's at home, and the cameras on Paul Bearer at home. But he's he can't go to the building. He's beat up and everything. This is the night that Kane makes a big announcement. The first time he uses the throat gimmick, and he uh-huh. announces that if he doesn't beat Austin, he's going to set himself on fire. So you're watching Paul Bearer at home, and you're watching the Paul Bearer react because he doesn't know Kane's going to say that. And then later on in the show, the payoff is that Undertaker goes to Paul Bearer's house and beats the crap out of him. All right, bro? Right. So, Ed. This was this is the greatest thing I've ever done in my career, and I'm a genius for this. Okay, so Ed, the first thing you see is we we establish that he's there. That's vignette number one. Vignette number two is we keep going back to him when Kane makes the 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 statement about I'm going to set myself on fire. Then number three, we go back, we get a react about what Kane said, and Paul like knew no knew nothing about it, bro. Vignette number four. Al Snow is 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 doing an in ring with Jerry the King Lawler, okay, bro. 
We uh-huh. go back to Paul Bearer's house randomly, bro, and he's shoving cheese doodles down his throat, drinking Coke and watching the show. Bro, that's brilliant. <laughs> that is absolute bro. And I said to Jeff, that may have been the, the, the highlight of the Attitude Era, to randomly go back to Paul Bearer eating cheese doodles, bro. Cheese doodles. Uh, was, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, how I great was how that. great was Paul Bearer? Ed? Go ahead, because I, I I kiss his backside every show. Go ahead. Ed. Uh, I mean, his backside deserves to be kissed. I mean, he was such he was such a pro. He was so smart. He was so good at what he did. He could go out and cut a promo and get heat from any crowd anywhere, and it just. He was so into that gimmick, and he was such a part of it. You believed him. Um, it's such a loss, and and he, you know, they don't they don't make him like him anymore. And like I said, just what a total class act. Always a hundred percent across the board. Never never got anything less than than perfection out of him when he was performing, and he was always so easy to work with. So is that is that enough backside kissing to yes, kind of balance yeah, you out a little bit? The day he told me uh, I I just killed the wrestling business because we marched the whack pack out uh, in front of the people. But go ahead, yeah. Jeff. Next, um, wrestling the, business was coughing up blood at that point. Anyway. <laughs> next was the second bonus match, and this was the New Age Outlaws defending the tag titles against the New Midnight Express. Outlaws win, retain. Ah. The <laughs> All right, now we, we can go over that. What's next? Shamrock and Rock, right? Yeah. Triple H is on commentary for this one. Uh, you know, he's the defending king of the ring last year. I liked how China was on the Spanish commentary table. and, and they put I that love that. Yeah. I love that because that added such depth to her character and showed so much that it made you go, wow, there is so much more than meets the eye to this character as opposed to just the big imposing chick stands there with her arms folded. I mean, she she showed so much in that one little bit. I loved that. Which that led to my favorite line of the show, when Jr. asked Triple H if he's bilingual, and Triple H said, "There's a lot of bi things I am, but lingual isn't one of them." <laughs> yeah, I was gonna call attention to that, and then he came back and said, "Wait, that's not what I meant to say, was it?" And and Jr. said, it, it, "You said it, buddy. It went out. It's li- we're live." Uh, there was another line that I, when I was writing it, I wrote down because I thought the irony was phenomenal when Triple H said, what separates champions from losers here in WWF? Not how much stroke you got with the guy running the show. Not how far you can stick your nose up somebody's butt who's running the show. It's all about who's toughest in that ring. So I just thought that was kind of ironic considering he went and married the boss's daughter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Ken Shamrock gets the win here with the ankle lock. He is the king of the ring. Do you remember what went into deciding who's going to be the king of the ring? Like, when, when this is all being laid out, where, how was the decision made? Okay, let's make Ken Shamrock the king of the ring. Well, probably, Jeff, who's right at the cusp and who needs it to go over the top. Uh, certainly, Rock did not need to be king of the ring. Shamrock was like kind of right there, and this could have helped put him over the top. So what it really comes down to is, you know, who, uh, you know, who, who, whose character can this really help the most and get to the next level? And it's it's so funny, bro. Now, because now you look at the champions at the WWE, Callisto is like the I think he's the U.S. champion. Bro, I can't even tell who's the Intercontinental. Cha- oh, oh, is Owens the Intercontinental champion? I, I couldn't even yes. tell. You. But but yeah, bro. What what little intangible could help the guy get to the next level? Ken was right there for this. But one thing I do want to bring up at this point, because something I noticed watching the show, uh, watching the pay per view last night, and I want to ask you, Vince, is this match, the Rock and Shamrock match, with when when uh, Hunter and Shine came on sat at the announce table. This made the third segment, for lack of a better term, third segment in a row with a DX aspect. You had X-Pac versus Owen. Then you had the tag title match with uh, with the New Age Outlaws. And then you had Triple H uh, uh, on commentary for this. Was there any thought or concern that that you had so much DX so you know, like, like jammed together in the middle of the show and not spread out? 
Well, you know that that's a that's a great question, Ed. But I think it would have um, if this were a raw. I think that definitely would have been brought into consideration. But being that it was a pay-per-view, and they were, you know, they were paying the money to really see Kane and Austin, and I mean, we had them there. You know, not not so much. But obviously, I don't think we would have we would have booked um, a, an episode of television this way. But I think with the pay-per-view, it was right. okay. I could just see, uh, th I could just see and hear in the back of my mind Hunter complaining about having to go out. Uh, yeah. For this, because they, they've already had so much DX yeah. and risking having a less lesser pop and a lesser effect yeah. for him to go out. Hunter wasn't at the point of complaining yet. That comes in this a couple more episodes. Right. This isn't the Zamboni promo, Hunter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Did you ever talk about the Zamboni promo? I don't. I don't know what you mean. You don't remember? I remember. Yeah, yes, I do. I remember. I remember them all sitting on the Zamboni and reading us the line <laughs> after something. So you might as well tell us now, because that's all. No, I remember. no, I don't. I don't even remember what it was in what it was in regard to. I yeah. just remember the they Zamboni were all sitting part. on the Zamboni and we got read the riot act for something. Yeah, yeah, for something that they didn't like that ultimately ended up going over like a million bucks. Yeah, that Vince edited. Go yeah. ahead. <laughs> yeah. So next is the Hell in the Cell, Undertaker of Mankind. Uh, I don't know how you guys want to tackle this when there's so much to this ma match, but Vince, you made an interesting comment to me on the phone about it. I don't know if you want to, you know, bring that up, com comparing it to the Sean match, you know, from the previous uh, fall. But you know, th this for a lot of people, myself included, is most memorable match in the history of the WWF for two bumps. You know what I mean? Two spots makes this for a lot of people the most memorable match. Well, one thing I want to point out that I just learned from Mick when I had him on the uh, that radio show, uh, Jeff, not too long ago. He basically told me he was talking about this match, and he said it was Terry Funk's idea for him to start the match on the top of the cage. And Mick said he thought Terry, you know, Terry Funk told him kidding around. I want you to start from, and he kind of laughed and like. <laughs> That's all that that's all you had to tell Mick and and that's really where this came from Ed. I had never really gone back and watched this match and it uh -huh. really blew me away because this match has become so legendary over the years. It really did blow me away that this match was two spots. That that was the match. It was two spots and the fact that, you know, the legendary status that it that that it's at today Man, when you go back and look at it, it was it was two death-defying spots, but the match was really built around two spots. I would say three spots, and also it was. I mean, yeah, it was it was brilliant psychology because it wasn't just about the match; it was about everything that was going on. It was about, oh my God, is Mick hurt? Did we just see something terrible happen? And him and and him fighting his way back and then climbing back up to the top of the cage and just all the drama that that surrounded those spots and i would say three spots because you can't you can't ignore the thumbtack spot either because that was like one of the first times that had ever been done on WWE TV if i remember mm -hmm. so that was another big thing what i didn't remember was the fact that the spot was you know a minute and a half into the match I, I completely yeah. forgot that it was the first spot in the match, yeah. and that and, and yeah. but it made it made everything make sense because then everything that happened after that was happening the way it did because of that spot. That spot set the tone for the entire thing, and it was about this this triumph of the human spirit for mankind or for Mick Foley at that point. That's this is the match where mankind really became Mick Foley because that's a, he earned so much respect from everybody for what he did. But yeah, I mean that that it's it's unbelievable and it's a masterpiece for those reasons. For the fact that there was so much going on on numerous levels. On the level of what was happening with with the actual talent with Mick Foley and then what was what the match was going on in the ring. And there were a lot of other things too, bro. I was telling Jeff on the phone yesterday uh, when you when I, going back and seeing this. Oh my gosh, bro! Could he have taken that bump any more perfectly? When oh, the, when they I showed it over and over, and you re I mean, he was in total control of his body for that entire bump. 
bro, like that that is artistry right there. So you had that art, you had the artistry of the bump. You had the artistry of my God Almighty, my God Almighty, he's killed him. This may yeah. have been JR's best called match of all oh, time. Yeah. You had God artistry. is my witness, he is broken in half. Yeah, you had the artistry of that. You had the artistry of uh, Dr. Francois Petit uh, ringside checking out Mick Foley. That to me, yeah. that to me may have been the highlight of this entire uh, of this to entire production. Well, that and then getting Terry Funk involved yeah. and and Jr. beautifully pointing out, you know, they've had their issues in the past. Basically, say, you know, okay, uh, this is. He's really hurt, and Funk is really a friend of his, and he's out here, you know, s subtly breaking kayfabe without breaking kayfabe, yeah. and it was brilliant. There was a few things that I remember about that. I mean, I seen Francois. I was like, uh, I I had forgotten about his involvement in it. Um, the one thing I did remember was that moment when he went off the top of the cage. I remembered I could hear the screams of the audience in the back. When I was standing around the monitor, and it was it was eerie, and it was one of those moments where in the back nobody knew this spot was going to happen, or the majority of people didn't know, and everybody was extremely concerned. They thought that something really terrible had happened, and yeah, something really terrible did happen, but it was intention intended. Um, uh, other things that that I remember, the spot through the top of the cage. That was that that if you remember that that was a little bit of a, of a screw up because yeah. it was not supposed to break away the way it did. Right. So it it gave him no resistance to slow his fall. And the other thing was the chair being on that segment came down on his face, and that's what knocked his tooth out through his face. Yeah. So uh, I, I mean, and then the other thing was when Taker came down through the roof of the cell. I don't know if you remember this, but he jammed his ankle when he came down. And you can see it when he lands. He kind of lands funky yeah. and he hops. Yeah. And uh, But you know Taker. He's not going to, after what Mick just did, the two bumps <laughs> Mick just did, Taker is not going to say, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm sorry, my I sprained my ankle. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. just my ankle. we got to call this. Throw up the X. That one, the second one, the noise when he hit that ring. Oh. Oh. It's just tremendous. You know what I mean? Like, and, and, I, and I, I may be wrong, but I think that's where Jr. yelled, "Will somebody stop the damn match?" And I yes. thought that was just as great of a call on Jr.'s part as as the first one. Yep. yep. But then you know Terry Funk gets involved again, choke slammed out of his shoes. I thought that that was right. cool. And then the match continues, and we got the tax the the tax spot. I, I loved how he. It wasn't good enough that I that I got you know back bumped onto the tax. I'm gonna roll around it a little bit and he rolled around the tax. And then they redid the spot because he didn't land really well. So then they redid it and Taker Taker nailed him. He got him on the tax the second time as if it wasn't enough. I mean, at that point in the match, Mick was Mick was in La La Land. Because I, the, the other thing that I do remember, because I was nearby when he first came backstage after the match, do you remember, Vince, what the first thing he said what? backstage? What? Did I do the thumbtack spot? Uh, Did we do the thumbtack <laughs> spot? He didn't even remember. God, bro. God, bro. Yeah. Um, oh, one thing I want to say, um, Jeff, I really love... This again, this is the separation that I have with today's product because I feel today's product is so spot orientated, it takes me out of there's supposed to be a fight going on here. It takes me out of that, that there's a real fight going on. And I'll never forget, JR said in this match, and I thought it was beautiful, he said, This match really defines. Hell in a cell. Because there was hell going on in that cell. It was absolute hell in that cell. Bro, you fast forward today, a hell of a cell match. They're doing spots inside the cell. <laughs> this was like, oh my God, I would not want to be in that cage. I mean, they're in I, hell. Yeah, and hell I just. Is yeah. in Pittsburgh tonight. Yeah, and I just love the way that, that JR said this, this, this defines a hell in the cell match. 
because you don't get that today, bro. And the fight, the fight is missing. And you want to talk about a fight. The, the next match was more of a fight than this one. Yeah, yeah. And they really, Austin and Kane, man, I, I, if, if, I, I don't remember. You know, I, I wasn't around, like I said, while, the, while the, the, the show was being laid out. But I can't imagine Austin, and especially Austin and Kane, not being concerned having to follow that especially if they if they knew what they were doing in that spot but man did they did they deliver and in such a way that it you you didn't it wasn't a letdown from what we had just seen it was not a letdown because it was a fight it was believable and you had those stakes are we going to see Kane let himself on fire i mean it was just and plus at that point Austin was just so over it was unbelievable i'm just curious to see where this goes on monday night because Something we we did something really good and really clever here, and the announces really didn't sell it. So I'm not sure why. I'm I'm not sure if they didn't sell it because it wouldn't have registered right away. And now we tell that story on the other side. I don't remember this, but the fact of the matter was, Taker poured the gas on the referee to mm -hmm. intentionally wake the referee up mm -hmm. to see that Austin was bleeding. Now, mm -hmm. you know, you got to remember, you're going into this match. That's right. Take his arch enemies with his brother. They want to kill each other. But he also let Austin know, I'm coming for your WWE title. I want to make no bones about it. But now, with that one spot where he's taking the gas... He's pouring it on the ref to get the ref up so the ref sees that Austin's bleeding. What Taker's doing right there is he's choosing blood. Blood is thicker than water. He's putting mm -hmm. the belt on his brother. Now, that that in itself is a story. You could talk about that for weeks. You could talk about what was Taker's motivation for weeks and weeks and weeks. And the announcers kind of didn't get into it. I'm assuming they didn't want to give anything away. They didn't want to put a spotlight on it. They wanted to give you something to think about. After the match is over, when, when now the pay-per-view is over and you're sitting at home, and now it's like, wait a minute. We can take a kind of just screwed Austin by bringing the ref too. You know? So now, now you're thinking about it after the show. Jeff, that's all part of driving them to the show Monday night. That's all part of it. So I'm, I'm really, really eager to see exactly how that's covered on Monday night because I totally forget. I forget too, but I'm pretty sure that we did something with the cell that night. I rem I'm pretty sure I remember that there was another cell match or something. Does yeah. that sound... I uh, what I remember is it's a rematch between these know. two, and I don't remember what the stipulation was if, if there was a cage or not. I just know Austin and Kane for the title is the main event the next night on Raw. Yeah, because I remember okay. like right, this, this disco was smartening me up. A disco says that uh, uh, um, Austin went out there and said the winner of the match was supposed to be the person who drew first blood. Kane didn't draw first blood. Taker did. You know, so he kind of he kind of used mm. that to get the the match. You know, I, I had like well, one's more of a question, and the second's an observation. Were you at all concerned with? Okay, if we take the title off of Austin here, is that going to slow the momentum of the storyline of Vince trying to screw Steve? Like, did you were you worried that this might be too soon, or did you know that in the grand scheme of things, this was just another step? Yeah, bro, bro, the the performers that Austin and Vince were, nothing was going to slow slow that down. Nothing, nothing, bro. Like, bro, if you hired the worst writer in the world. To put that story together and help them with dialogue, nothing was gonna slow. Bro, you had you, you arguably, you know, now we, we can throw other names into the equation, but you arguably had two of the greatest talkers slash performers of all time working together. Now, bro, you can say Dusty and Flair. You know, there's a million other combos you can put together. But you've got to put Austin McMahon like right up there. Nothing, nothing was gonna slow that down, bro. Would you agree, Ed? I would agree 100%. Everything they did, they made golden. 
Um, and again, it's it's like what we always say. You know, yeah, we we wrote all, all the, the you know we wrote so much of this stuff, but it wasn't just that. It was we had the perfect team that we were a part of. We had Vince who who knew what he wanted. He had a vision for the product, and we were seeing that vision through. We had the most unbelievably talented roster uh, for the guys who you know these this was. This was the cutting edge, and these were the guys who were going to be the next generation of superstars at the point where they were all breaking through almost at the same time. So we just had such an unbelievable crew with the announce team and Jr. as the you know the 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 the, the, the coach in 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 uh, talent relations. It was just unbelievable. So yeah, we but we at the top of the pyramid, you had Austin and McMahon, and that is what paid everybody's salary at the end of the day. Hey, Ed, let me ask you this. You bring up the term team, and you mm -hmm. said team a couple of times, and you and I sit here. We have no – bro, somebody asked me on Twitter yesterday, oh, did you come up with uh, uh, the people's elbow and something with oh, Austin 316? And I was like, yeah, you know, I wish I did. I said that was all the talent, man, all the talent. My point is you and I sit here – we have no problem putting everybody over. We, bro, I can't tell you how many times I've told a story a million times of you and I, it became a game where we would try to write a flawless show where Vince would not be able to pick one thing out. Mm -hmm. And we would bring it to him, and he would every time pick something out, a little thing, whatever it was, and make it better. And you and I would be, why the frick didn't we see that? We'd really be pissed at each other. And yeah. and I, I've told that story. Like, that's that was Vince's genius. And why is it that, like, we sit here and, like, we have no problem putting everybody over, including Vince McMahon? But 15 years later, we're totally sh** on uh, they're they're constantly you know we were we were one of many writers, it, it, we had no impact. Vince was the great editor. And seriously, why when I have no problem putting Kevin Dunn over and Vince McMahon and Jr. and Bruce, no problem whatsoever. What do you think the problem is with putting the writers of that era over? I think it's because, you know, like we've always said, it's an example of the, the winners getting to write the history books. And if you remember, even back at that time, we weren't put over. Do you remember Cigar Aficionado? Yeah, absolutely I do, yep. That article in Cigar Aficionado with Vince and Shane sitting with cigars and talking about how they come up with all the stuff on TV. Didn't even mention us. I mean, not saying that we're looking for for attaboys, but also looking for recognition where it's due. And and it's a matter of they, they can't do that because that doesn't match the version of history that they're choosing to sell. So that's why. And it's not going to change because of the fact that that's what they want the history books to read, that it was all Vince, because that's what that's what helps their corporate image right now. And you know, it's it's unfortunate, but there are plenty of people who do realize that we had a part in that. And again, I, you know, the fact that we're that we're laying claim to whatever of whatever impact we did have on the business, you know, you know, you've got you've got some people who uh, maybe aren't fans, like your Lex Luthor that you were talking about, and people who follow Lex Luthor, and uh, basically, you know, don't want to give any credit, refuse to acknowledge any credit. So, yeah, you know, it's just I, I I've learned to I've learned to not care about it because of the fact that you know I know what we did, you know what we did, we know what we did. There's enough people out there who who uh, accept that and and who appreciate what we did and for me that's good enough. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, do you have any last questions for uh, Ed or you might want to ask Ed what he might want to ask you? Uh, whatever, <laughs> Jeff. It's... Can I just ask can I just ask a question cuz just now two times Vince said ask. So what's going on? Are you trying to sound all all, all British on me now? You know I, I, I said it right, ask. You said ask twice. Right, I said it correctly. Were you, were you doing that to impress me? Were you doing that no, just because I'm on the I'm show today? No, maybe I'm just trying to get the word right after all these oh. years, you know? <laughs> hey, Ed, do you remember? i got to ask you this question. Here you go. That's three. Ask. Go ahead. The first time you were there, 
Mm -hmm. Ed, you're a big... Uh, 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 how do I put this, Ed? You're a big. Uh, uh, you enjoy the ganji, uh, you know the uh, <laughs> the grape, uh, you know, if you will, the cannabis. Uh, were you? Did you get high your first time there? I mean, not. Were you ever high at a show? You mean working? Yes. Absolutely not. Would you? Absolutely. Smoke, not. Would you smoke the night of? After the show, would you smoke? Not when I was. Not when I was with WWF. No way. No way, because the thing is, didn't know when when uh, Vince was going to call us at two in the morning to get together in Shano's room to go over the show the next day. <laughs> what so, about, no. What about WCW? No time. WCW, TNA. Sometimes in WCW at the end, but usually it was just it would, I would just. Conan was Conan the Clooper. You and Conan. <laughs> no, actually, I'd never smoked with Conan. Really? Never smoked with Conan. No, never. Did, never had the opportunity. At least I don't think so. Maybe I did. You and Eric. I, mean, I know I partied you and Eric, with him. You and Eric oh, yeah, light up a doobie. You and Eric. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No, me, me and Eric would drop eating and go to the club. <laughs> no. Bro, they don't believe me. I was telling this story the other day. Don't. Bro, everybody thinks I'm a lawyer, right? That's why I'm glad I have you on the show. And remember, we stayed at the freaking Holiday Inn Express, and Eric was a mile down the road at the most expensive uh, <laughs> hotel in, 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 in Nashville. Bro, am I yep. making that up? Or were we the two jabrones no. at the Holiday Inn Express, but Eric was a, a, a half a mile down the road at the most expensive hotel in Nashville, bro? Yeah, no, no exaggeration whatsoever. I mean, we were the jabrones working in the business lounge on the sixth floor because there was free coffee. Yes. Um, and that was it. And, and, and everybody, any other guests from the hotel, we would give them dirty looks when they yeah. would come in the room. Jeff, we, we would just... take over the, the lounge. And because there was free coffee, and we little we literally set up shop in the lounge. And bro, there was a computer in the lounge for any any you know any person can use in the hotel. And people would come in during our booking meetings, and we would sit there and give them dirty looks until they felt uncomfortable and left. And meanwhile, Eric's got a freaking penthouse suite doing who knows <laughs> what he was doing up there because he certainly wasn't right in the show, bro. I could tell you that much. Yeah. He was he was practicing his roles when we got together the next day, and I had anything to say. Yeah, exactly. And and but I, I mean, don't you know when the people came in the game in the lounge, you know, you you were always there. You know, there was nothing there was nothing that would scare anybody away about you sitting there with your shoes off, with your holes in your socks, with your feet up on the coffee right. table. You know, that, and, nothing nothing. And the biggest yeah. pop I got in the lounge uh, came from Mr. Matt Conway. Uh -huh. Because Jeff, right across the street, you, you, McDonald's was right across the street. So out the window, you could see McDonald's. And all of a sudden, we're working up there one day, and there's like a mob at McDonald's. It's like lunchtime, and there's a mob scene. And I'm, I look out the window, I'm like, what the hell is going on at McDonald's? To what Mr. Conway looked out the window and saw the crowd, and Mr. Conway replied, is the McRib back? And it popped me <laughs> huge, bro. I'll never forget that as long as I live. Not time. Oh, my God. <laughs> Anything else, Jeff? Yeah, I just had, uh, for, our, for our viewers like this timeline information, and I know you don't always remember the details. Maybe Ed does. I'm guessing the way the shows were taped at this time. The next night was Raw, and most likely Tuesday was the Raw taped for the following week. Because it was tape, it was the live raw tape raw on Tuesday. What did you shadow at both of those shows? In the following week, it was official. You started writing with Vince, or how did? Do you remember the timeline there? I vaguely do. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I mean, I do remember aspects of it. I was there for King of the Ring. I was there for Raw, the live Raw, the next night, and then I flew home the next morning. I didn't because what was it? We we went. Uh, King of the Ring was in Pittsburgh. Raw was in Cleveland, I believe, and it was a drive. And I was I, I was in Kevin Dunn's car he for the for the ride from Pittsburgh to Cleveland. And then I flew out of Cleveland the next morning, so I wasn't there for the tape draw. And then uh, I don't think I was out in Connecticut the next week, but I was. I did do some work. Well, maybe I was because there was a while there where where I was flying back and forth to book. With Vince and Vince, um, uh, and then I would fly back to Los Angeles until I moved to Connecticut, which was about 
I think like a month later was when I actually made the move to Connecticut. So yeah, so I wasn't there for the tape draw, but then I was at least flying out to Connecticut the following week to work on TV with Vince and Vince. Did Vince call you that same week and offer you the job, bro? Do you remember or was it? Yeah, he called me on Thursday. Wow. It was my, my yeah. phone rang and I get a call from Vince McMahon and he just said to me, well, really like meeting you this week. Uh, Want to give you a call and see uh, what do you think? Uh, how you feel about doing this full time? And I was like, holy sh! Really? I mean, I there was no way I expected this in a middle in in a million years. No way in hell. Um, and I just you know got when I got off the phone, I went into the other room with Franny and I said, uh, I think we're moving to Connecticut. Mm. And she was like, what? And I, and I explained to her about the phone call I just had. So, yeah. And then we moved to Connecticut, and the rest was history. The rest was history, rest ladies was and history. gentlemen. There nice button it. to the whole thing. Nice button uh, to the whole thing. Nice little button to the finish. Nice. Good looking, uh, popular. Well, Ed, man, listen, bro, that was tremendous. Listen, I, people say, you know, like, and even Jeff was saying, oh, you know, you think we can get Ed, we, you think we can get Ed, you think we can get Ed, you think we can get Ed, and I was like, bro, I would bring Ed on the show every freaking <laughs> single week. The difference is Ed has a job, and I'm a, I'm, I'm a bum. So, <laughs> you know, you bro, you have to know any, any, any time you want to come on, bro. It's, it's such a freaking treat to have you on here, Ed. Well, I mean, I, I do. I want to. I want to. I want to be uh, on more because, again, just getting a chance to just shoot the shit with you, which is something that don't get to do as much as I'd like to, and it would be a way to to do that anyway because you're podcasting, you know, twelve days a week anyway. Yeah. So that 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 would be awesome. Plus, you know, we got the thing coming up in Dallas, which I'm really looking forward. Yeah, to Yeah, plug that, that thing. Do plug All that right. thing, Ed. Go All right, I'm gonna plug that thing. I'm gonna plug that thing. Anybody. Who is going and to Jeff be... Lane is going. If the the uh, lefty Lane over there is going to be there, really, with us. you're going yes. to be there too, Jeff? Bro, it's going to oh, be the you. first time I meet. I never me and Jeff have never met in person, bro. It's going to be the oh, first that's time. Awesome. Yeah, that is awesome. I'm I'm looking forward to to meeting you too, Jeff. I mean, yeah, same. That's, that's a yeah. I mean, this has been great, but now to meet you in person. Uh, l let me see. Uh, uh, Saturday, April second, WrestleCon. Uh, Vince and I will be appearing at WrestleCon. We're doing a. Uh, uh, Q and A session at eleven o'clock in the morning, and then from noon to five, we're doing a meet and greet. Vince bro, tell MLW they never. Bro, how come they never had me on that show? MLW. You did go on that show. You were on uh, once. Was I? Yeah, you were. Yeah. All right. I never mind. Go ahead. <laughs> See, Jeff, this is this is this is what your life is. This is what my life was. But now, now it's your week to watch yeah. it. Now it's your turn to watch him. I'm done. I'm tagging yeah. out. We'll be in the middle of a show sometime, and he'll be like, "Is this uh, who watches this? Is this a free show or is this a VIP show?" <laughs> you know, we should have a podcast sometime where it's just me and you, Jeff, and we just we just talk about Vince. <laughs> All right, we just sounds tell good. Vince stories, or we or we have Vince on the show, but he just he can't talk. He's just got to watch. <laughs> yeah, I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> well, you know, at any time, man. You, you you I mean, literally, you got caught blanche here, bro. Literally, oh, anytime you oh. want to come on, man. I will be back. I mean, this was great. I was glad we got a chance to do this. Uh, I'm really, really happy. And again, I am so looking forward to seeing you. I mean, this is going to be, this is going to be the first time, probably the second appearance that you and I have, second public appearance that we've made as a team yeah. since WCW ended, and the first one in five years. The last one was that five years ago when we met out in Colorado at that theater, and yeah. we did that yeah. that one thing. But we have, you know, we don't. Do appearances together because I don't generally do appearances. So I'm really looking forward to this. But I'm I'm so looking forward to getting to see you because like like I said, haven't seen you in over five years. Yeah. So that long overdue. Yeah, and do me a favor if you will. Would you mind you just got? one last favor? Would you mind? What do you got? What do you got? Uh, you know when you see you know uh, when you see trips down there at full sale, tell them I said yeah. hi. Tell everybody I said hi. I hope they're doing well. You know. All right, Ed. You know your little secret, bro. Well, when we're when we're in those when we're in those production meetings, you know, I, I can't bring that stuff up at the production meetings. But if I, you know, if we're, if we're backstage after the show, yeah. If, yeah, I'll pull them aside while they're taping. You know, while one of the one of the you know one of the J bro matches. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and, but make sure uh, you're not wearing a jacket because I I don't want you to catch cold. All right, no. listen, everybody, the great Ed Ferrara, the lazy uh, Jeff Lane, 
Gentlemen, great show. I enjoyed every minute of it. Again, Ed, from the bottom of our heart, thank you very much. No, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Anybody out there, if you want to follow me on Twitter, at the Ed Ferrara. I just tweet. I'll bro, do the occasional tweet. See, bro, you're extending out the interview because I'm, I'm remembering things uh, as, I, as I go on. Bro, you were writing the greatest book in the history of books. Uh, you had the vampires versus the zombies. And I could not wait. This sounded un. Jeff loves that stuff, by the way. Jeff really? loves that stuff. Jeff, he was writing the zombies versus the werewolf. The 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 the, the uh, uh, vampires. Vampires, bro. What happened to that, bro? What happened with that was I got I got a job and I didn't have time to work on it anymore. One of these days, Come maybe I'll on. finish how it. Can, I got. I, I'm about three you, chapters away from finishing it. How I know. Can you not I know. Three freaking chapters, bro. Ah, I know, I know, I know. I got. I, I mean, it's really, it's really sad. I haven't had time to do really any writing. But you, again, that's why I'm not on the show more. My schedule is so insane, and it changes all the time, and it's, it's so hard for me to get any sort of momentum going. But I, I'm, I'm getting to the point where now I'm getting a handle on it, and maybe I will finish it one of these. And what days. was that other book you wrote that you gave me a copy of? And the if short can, stories. Yeah. Short what was stories? the name of that? It was called Dark Consequences. It was just, it was something I self published. It's not even, I don't even have a copy of it. I was just going to add, you have none of those lying around, bro? Because Jeff would love it. I got the, I got, I'll tell you what, I got one story I'll send him that I wrote that got published in an anthology and it also got done on a on an audio podcast and it's a wrestling horror story. Jeff loves Sweet. all that stuff. Hey, hey uh, Jeff, you know what Ed loves, bro? What? The, the Avengers. Yeah, nice. Hey. Look at look at what I was drinking out of on the That's awesome. I'm just a Marvel geek, and I see Jeff, you are too, because oh, I see geez. the Marvel zombies behind you and all that stuff. Just show uh, show Ed the beautiful Christmas gift uh, that I sent, please. Uh, the the one right behind you. Yeah, show Ed the beautiful gift I sent. Let's see that. I love this. The great Newman. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Say, so, say something yeah. so you can see. Yeah. Say something so you can see, Jeff. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's oh, awesome. That's awesome. That yeah. is really The great cool. Newman action figure. Yeah. Uh, I love so it. your big Seinfeld mark? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Fantastic. Love it. I hadn't, I hadn't seen that one. I had seen some of the Seinfeld ones, and I saw the, uh, the Breaking Bad ones that they have that that company puts out. All right. All right. Listen, Ed, you, you've right, taken enough of my time today. To be I know. Honest. I know. So I'm going to wrap this thing up. Ed, I stop, love please. you. Bro, you always know. I always say you're the brother I never had. I love you. We've been through a lot together. Uh, just for the record, I want everybody to know that you know we're both liars. And before this, show, I called Ed uh, to, to you know, and we got on the same page uh, with the lies and everything that we told. But uh, Ed, thank you so much, bro, for just being in my life. What can I say? Uh -huh. Hey, it goes both ways, kid, and I say the same thing. You're the brother I never had, and I love you, and, I, and I'm always glad to talk to you. And uh, sorry we're getting all mushy in front of you, yeah. Jeff. No, no, I love it, man. And thanks for, love, thanks we, for coming we, on the show, Ed. It was, it was awesome having you on here, man. Right on. And, Thank and we you, love, guys. We love you, Jeff, too. I mean, if, yeah, I love you, John. I, oh, yeah. I, just, I just met you, Jeff, but I, I love you. I love you. <laughs> kind of like a guy too. crush. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. Listen, that's enough, everybody. Right, listen, we'll see you here. We'll, I'll see you here tomorrow with Bucket Full of Chicken next that I'm going to go do right now. Thanks for joining us, everybody. King of the Ring, 1998. Hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. See you, see you next time.